everybody back here to uh, Siegel Talks at the Martin E. Siegel uh, Theater Center at the Greater Center CUNY. And uh, it's a, a cold day in uh, New York City, gray, and um, there's a big warning out for a storm that is coming, a big snowstorm that will also put the eating outdoors uh, um, to rest. Um, it's uh, still incredible times, if I understand right, in one day over 200,000 infections. Um, it's uh, just um, unbelievable what we are going through in, in the moment. But we at the Siegel, as so many others, we do think about art, about uh, culture, about history, about the political context we live in, and um, how we can create meaning uh, in these times. And artists have been always part uh, um, of that discussion. They have helped us to understand better who we are and through artists and through their way. Um, we, we see the world differently, better, and perhaps we get a little bit accustomed to, to the future and we understand the ideas of a community of uh, sharing um, um, moments um, um, of life here uh, where we are on planet Earth. We have been so reminded as always how precious it all is. Uh, now that we lost it, a wrong handshake can kill us now. Who knows, some of us, some of the readers, some of our listeners might not be alive in a couple of months. I might not be, we don't know. And so of course, it's a moment of, of deep reflection. What does it really mean? What are we doing? What is essential and what is necessary? What has changed and um, what, uh, what, what will change? And with us today, we have a great worker uh, in the field of theater, in the field of uh, writing, in the field of criticism, and in the field of uh, editing, someone who uh, has for almost 50 years now edited an influential, very significant um, uh, journal about theater performance and art. It's uh, Bonnie Maranka. So Bonnie, really, thank you. Thank you for uh, uh, being with us and, uh, and for uh, taking the time uh, to, um, to speak to us, uh, first of all, in the name of everybody, I wanted to thank you because in your great journal, PAJ, a magazine of uh, performance and art, you, you published excerpts of our thoughts. It made us very proud and uh, it was a lot of work you, you put in and you thought you saw something in what we did. So I really would like to, to thank you. you know, we were so, so um, inspired by it as we were with TDR. Carol Martin mentioned us, Richard Schachner, but uh, also your, um, your work as you have done over five decades now um, um, is, uh, is stunning. So it's a great uh, matter of pride for us to be part of it. So thank you for, for being with us uh, in here in New York to give our- Thank uh, you. Yeah, so how are you today? Oh, uh, I'm pretty good. <laughs> I, I'm fine. Um, you know, just uh, kind of deciding what I'm going to do today. Uh, I, I have various, phone calls and meetings and things in the afternoon and reading and I don't know the days pass very quickly actually yeah it's even, stunning I even if I spend the whole day inside which I do often they the time goes fast yeah it, it does so for our listeners to give a little bit of an idea we also have many international ones which we welcome here on Hull Round and at the Siegel Talks mm -hmm. Bonnie Maranka is the founding publisher and editor of the OB award-winning PAJ Publications. And this is her great contribution next to many others, of course, but it's PAJ, a journal of performance and art. It started- By the way, it's 45 years, not 50. <laughs> Almost in the fifth decade. Yeah, it started in 1976 in its fifth decade. Give me and, a she has uh, done so many, so many awards uh, for this from Art for Higher Education, just in sustained an achievement, the great and significant uh, George Nathan, G. Nathan Award for Dramatic Criticism. And she has uh, really edited countless volumes of, of the journal of plays, of books. Um, Meredith Monk, a new place from Europe, place from the continent, place from the end of the century, for the end of the century, small series on conversations on art and performance, uh, interculturalism and performance. She also writes about uh, food, about Hudson Valley, uh, about gardening, uh, many, many others. She really is a writer and has a great love for writing uh, and for, um, for, for the arts and uh, for the culture. She is a Guggenheim Fellow and uh, has been to Japan with the Asian Cultural Council, a great organization. She was a, 
uh, it also in Berlin, uh, uh, I think, in the American Academy, which is a very big. Uh, the, the free free university on the full university right. yeah, at yeah. the beginning, and um, and then also a Fulbright Senior Belasco Foundation, and she's a professor emerita of theater at the New School here. Um, in New York City, and I really—it's uh, impossible to um, to uh, really uh, sum it up in, in such a short time, um, Bonnie. Um, your work um, always uh, uh, made us aware that part of great art is a critical writing about it. The, almost an archival quality that there's a record of this ephemeral, uh, uh, um, as you also wrote, you know, um, appearance of something, this apparence. And, um, and if it's not written about it, somehow it is lost. Um, in this moment we are in now, where we all take account um, what what we are doing, why we are doing it. Is it worth it? Is it worth the effort? Does it work? If you look at your work as a, as a writer and an editor in this moment, what's going on in your mind? What are you thinking about? <clears throat> well, I, I guess uh, one, of the, uh, one of the major things that anybody would be thinking about uh, you know, in terms of, uh, let's say, editing the journal, because I'm still responsible with my uh, now associate editor, Ben Gillespie, um, who was from CUNY also. Mm -hmm. um, we're responsible for three issues a year and also with our contributing editors um, who are dispersed around the country. So the question is like, what does one do at a time like this? Uh, yeah, all the questions you raise, uh, is, is it worth it? What is the value of doing things? How can you write? How can you address things? In the beginning of the, the uh, pandemic last spring, I, I was in New York for, th for, for three months then, uh, during that time, starting the lockdown in March. Um, I spoke to many people who, who write and who, you know, see many things, people in visual arts and dance and theater. And uh, everyone said they just didn't feel like writing. Uh, people who, who are professional writers in the sense of learning their living that way, uh, it is very hard to gather your thoughts in the beginning. But, you know, we went through different periods of like fear and anxiety and then somehow, you know, adjustment and reflection and all, all these uh, different kinds of, um, uh, uh, you know, feelings that, you um, that helped us get cope now eight or nine months, 10 months later. So the uppermost is the question like, what does one do with the journal at this time? A lot of what we do is to cover, you know, current events and so on. And um, uh, things that are being performed very, very, you know, very, very much of our time. So we didn't have that. So one of the things was the, that, you know, to perhaps cover artist documentaries um, so, like in particular, I had asked one of our writers to write about um, the recent Lorraine Hansberry and uh, Baldwin um, uh, artist documentaries. Uh, other people wrote essays um, directly related to um, the pandemic and um, cultural politics and, um, you know, funding and different artworks. Um, we published the whole, uh, uh, you know, excerpts from the pandemic section from uh, all of your talks uh, mm. over a period of a few months. Um, so that's one of the things, how to keep a journal and how to keep, you know, your publishing schedule. Um, the print version wasn't sent out. Um, the first um, two issues during this time, only the online version was available, but now print is available and MIT has been able to uh, keep to the schedule and everyone has adjusted in terms of publishing. For my own work, I started, um, I, I uh, um, you know, fin finished uh, uh, editing the interview with the conversation with Meredith Monk, which uh, just came out um, this month uh, and wrote the preface. And I also uh, organized um, a book of mine that'll come out in the spring, Timelines. So I put that together. So I, I was always, I've always been working. 
um, yeah, yeah. during this time, and also trying to explore and find you know find out from various people who write for PAJ what kinds of things we should cover, what they're thinking about, what they might be finding online, especially things that might you know be dealing with new new forms and new new ways to cover uh, work or something special online. So you know we're still grappling with that. And uh, hey, it also written to a um, hundred of our authors. Uh, over the last um, recent years, people who've contributed to the journal. And um, there was a, a list of topics that we posed. And so added to the usual topics that we we're interested in, like um, uh, performance histories and um, also uh, ecological uh, issues and climate change, um, I was interested if people you know, were able to write or address issues like authoritarianism and fascism and this kind of um, uh, politics. So, there, so we did get responses and people um, you know, have been thinking about different topics and where they might fit in with this expansion of, of topics um, in addition to our regular ones that we might want to address. So that, that's basically what I've been doing these last months in terms of writing or editing. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think uh, uh, you, you are such a hard worker. You work so much. It's astonishing what you produce. You know, you're like a great painter, you know, who puts out the paintings and over decades uh, there's changes of colors, themes, structures, but still always you see the handwriting. I think this has been true for PAJ. I think you wrote, uh, uh, I think, um, that the health of an art form is connected to the rigor of critical thinking that's circulating around it. What, how do you see the contemporary moment and the critical thinking about it um, in, 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 the, in the theater? We just left because we're no longer in there, but even now where we don't have the theater, what is the, the rigor of critical thinking? Do you feel we are in a moment where this is taking place? Um, you know, in recent years, we've lost so many different venues where um, people would write criticism, uh, traditionally criticism over the period of the P PAJ has been publishing was in the Soho Weekly News, the Village Voice, um, mm -hmm. the New York Press, maybe the New York Observer, in addition to things like um, the Times and so on, and also American Theater Magazine, so many things have closed. So mm -hmm. there, there are online blogs and things, but it's not the same as, um, uh, you know, a community that, uh, you know, has access to and, and, and generally people read um, the same pieces and, and uh, they're, they become important. For example, in the establishment of the, um, of the downtown theater, which we focus on, um, those reviews and the reviewing um, and the writing was also very, very important to people. And that was a time where people had, you know, very high standards and um, for, for work and were very demanding. Um, a lot of people wrote books also and collected criticism. Um, in, this, in this sort of vacuum, everything now has become mostly absorbed into, um, into journals. So <clears throat> in this country, there's um, our, our journal, the Drama Review, coming out of NYU. Also, the the uh, theater uh, uh, journal, uh, theater it's called, um, which Yale produces. And then there's Theater Journal, which is from the uh, American Theater and Higher Ed. So all of us publish, um, uh, you know, reviews and um, and essays. And then there are many. Um, there's so many journals now in theater around the world. There are also the the British journals. But um, in general, criticism uh, has has not has has kind of fallen by the wayside in a sense because people have turned toward theory at least since the '80s. So it's become very academic and institutionalized the discourse. Um, and regular journalism um, in the newspapers or what's around or magazines is generally not uh, the kind you know on the level of what you know we had been used to at in in, in film writing or. Um, uh, you know, in in um, in theater, so I think that there's a bit of a, a of a vacuum, and it's hard to know like why any one thing is more important than another, or why one should see something, or what uh, what is the broader context of something. So in that sense, that 
the, the kind of critics who did that mostly don't, don't really have venues. And if they write at all, it's usually um, in a journal um, or in a book, which comes out after many years. Mm -hmm. uh, and the journals only come out a few times a year. And they're mostly read online also. And, and, and one big change with um, editing and publishing is that people no longer read a journal from cover to cover and read everything in it. They generally have become so specialized now um, since mostly academics read these journals um, and that they read the work that pertains to them. So we've lost um, a, a kind of a, 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 a sort of a core of um, meaning and reflection in the body of work. It's just very, very dispersed now to many different audiences and very specialized. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, it's it is a moment of loss, not only because of that time of COVID, but important, you know, uh, people we we have loved over time. Not only Susan Sontag, Ed Said, uh, Pina Bausch, Miss Cunningham, uh, Harold Pinter, Ellen Stewart. Um, it's a, a a whole universe which you uh, covered, you know, since the since the very beginning. I mean, I have here some some names of what you have covered on very early, as you know, of course. Others, but still, you had Robert Wilson, Philip Glass, Meredith Monk, the Wooster Group, Trisha Brown, Robert Ashley, Maria Irene Fornes, Laurie Anderson, George uh, Mikunas, and I'm Jim Pike, and and of course uh, the list uh, goes on and on. Carolyn Sneberg and uh, uh, John Jonas. Um, it is it is an, an incredible um, 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 discourse. I think. Uh, as someone wrote, I think once an essay, uh, uh, why can't we stop, stop talking, you know, about uh, the, uh, the, the uh, 70s, Edmund White or someone, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you have a, a unique per perspective, you know, someone like uh, Schachner or also Marin Carlson and, uh, for looking over decades um, on, on, the, on the field. <laughs> What are your um, your reflections on the impact uh, on, um, on 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 <clears throat> the moment of, of how would I say you know the theater the performance uh, to New York City? It has changed so dramatically. What, what do you think are we going through right now at this moment? <laughs> it's such a it's such a big question. Um, uh, I I don't know if we know really where we're going because um, until we come out of this uh, pandemic situation, we don't know what the finances are, um, whether or when, if and when audiences will return to the theater, what the situation is for all the people who are working in it. And I'm concerned, of course, as an editor and a writer and theater goer um, to see how this a, you know, terrible experience, this uh, existential crisis in a way, and financial crisis, how, how, and health crisis, how, how it affects people's thinking. You know, will there be a different psychology of character? Will people, how will people think of space? What will, will the notion of, um, of, um, of truth, uh, how will that be dealt with in an era where, which has been called a post-truth time? And also what does reality and realism mean now when so much of what we see has been, um, you know, called into question and denied? Um, so uh, I, I can't really predict what, what will happen. Uh, for myself, I would like to see more of an emphasis on writing in the theater, which is to say new forms of uh, dramatic writing, new forms of, of uh, new, new, new play and theater forms. Mm -hmm. um, you, you, read, you wrote in one of your essays or interviews where you said there is a general disregard of working with writers in that you detect at the moment a bit in the, mm -hmm. in the scene. You're a big, uh, you're a big uh, uh, you know, uh, supporter of traumatic writing, you know. Do you, do you think this will change or we will see? Well, you know, um, we've kept to our um, original uh, mission, which is to publish a play or performance text, but that has, has very wide, wide parameters um, and includes any kind of uh, text or avant-garde um, piece of writing. 
um, not what we think of as conventional plays. Um, but we still do that uh, in every issue and have published over over a thousand and especially plays in translation or plays, you know, or plays from the more um, unconventional non mainstream theater downtown, but definitely uh, over at least 20 years or if not more uh, 25 there's been a move away from dramatic literature once one passes the undergraduate level um, in terms of you know theater study on the graduate level and the PhD level, and, and even in terms of the kinds of uh, contributions we get to the journal or what you see in other journals. Um, people are not writing about dramatic literature um, on playwriting as much as they used to before. Instead, we've moved toward what many people call devised theater, um, a theater that's more built on um, uh, the intersection of many different kinds of texts or more, more like a collage structure and often uh, not, uh, definitely not with the writer at the center of, um, of theater, um, but uh, maybe put together by a group of actors or put together by the director. And I, I, don't, I don't really, um, you know, consider this as, as, as complex a form uh, in most cases um, as writing. So uh, looking toward the future, I would like to see a, a kind of um, philosophic um, poetic theater with also a, a lot of new experimentation in terms of forms of writing, um, real avant-garde writing. So I hope that that returns. Um, and maybe, it, maybe it's on its way because of the uh, the sense of privacy we have now in spending a lot of time at home and not working together. I, I don't know. Uh, different forms produce different kinds of um, language and different kinds of acting. So it remains to be seen what, where we will go, um, you know, in the future. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, early on, you know, here and that's kind of, and you said pre-performance, I think you wrote about new forms of, of writing and art um, that we um, need to have uh, critical standards um, of value and comparison that this is the contribution you make and others make, TDR makes, um, our journals. Um, um, you say there's a difference between criticism and writing. Where do you draw the difference? Oh, you know, um, uh, yeah, I, 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 I've always made a, a, a difference between uh, writing and, and criticism. Um, but now we don't have criticism so much in terms of the world we exist in because a lot of it is, uh, a lot of it is theoretical writing um, um, done by, um, by academics rather than journalists. But uh, quite a while ago in the mid eighties, I called my first book, my first collection of um, of work, theater writings, and um, that that was a direct um, uh, uh, opposition to theater criticism. Now, of course, I've always valued criticism, and sometimes I use the terms interchangeably. But what I meant by writing at that time was that I consciously uh, developed uh, over the decades now. Uh, in my writing, the um, intimacy of the of the personal of the voice, um, I I like to write work that you can speak that you could. Um, that's not like reading a text or reading an essay. I tried to really, um, and I promote this with people who write for the journal as well, to bring their critical voice um, to the forefront. So I'm interested in, in poetic techniques and techniques of the novel and um, uh, writing that people who are not necessarily doing academic writing um, uh, have brought into their own work, so their essays, like there are so many good essayists now, um, uh, Siri Hustvedt, uh, Marilyn Robinson, um, Teju Cole, uh, D Daniel Mendelssohn, um, uh, um, uh, Sadie Smith, uh, they're, they're just innumerable um, good essayists, and, and none of these works are theoretical and they're not filled with jargon. They're real writers thinking. I love the work of uh, William Gass or Sontag or Brodsky or Octavio Paz, uh, you know, Elizabeth Hardwick, uh, real writers and literary stylists. So I, 
that's what I meant by by theater writing to bring different kinds of um, of techniques, not previously brought into or what was considered um, um, you know kind of rigorous um, critical writing, but to but to capture the quality of of, of, of the voice and um, have, a, have a kind of literary quality. Now I realize that that might not be um, certainly not in, in fashion in the, in the uh, academic world um, because people have been forced into a certain way of writing. But I find that I'm able to get writers who write in, in a more um, literary journalistic way. It's a kind of high journalism. Mm -hmm you know, in a mm -hmm. sense, and they, they have different kinds of writing, some for their academic credentials and others, um, they'll write in this style in, in, uh, in PAJ and they're happy to do it. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, oh, so that's wow. my, my vision of how I contrasted theater and writing mm -hmm. and criticism. Mm -hmm. That often also, you know, novelists or essayists will write very complex subject matters, but in a language that is accessible and understood, yeah. meanwhile, uh, perhaps, in, in some part, you know, writing or criticism on, on, on theater when it comes to the abstract formulation of theories and, our, you know, it's no longer as easy to, um, to access. You also say, um, on, you define your work at PHA, so you say it's a critical thinking against the current. It's something you should have a new form, um, um, as you said, uh, with a standard. It should be uh, uh, the, and the, the things we already do not know, you say, you know, so many write about things we already know, the artists we have seen. Um, so um, what do you feel do we need now, if you say it's against the current, which also means that it has been achieved something, but now it's the next. It's not there, as uh, Bart uh, said about democracy, you know, or something. Um, that it's never there. It's coming. It will be with us. It's never been um, um, uh, achieved as in Cardoso, the Supreme Court justice that that you know that law is it's on some wall in New York. It's always coming. It's not here yet. So what are we writing about? Are you writing about the current now? What do you say? What voices do we need to hear? Of artists or of critical voices? C critical voices in the moment. Yeah, and perhaps connected to artists, but of critical voices. I um, have a. An Italian friend, he's a scholar and um, wrote many books in Italy and ran festivals and uh, organized encyclopedias and, and everything, Antonio Attizani. And he said many years ago when we had a conference in New York um, connected with NYU that um, a critic can't wait for a theater. You yeah. know, so, <laughs> so in a way you have to create your subjects. Um, which is also what I tried to do. I tried to bring a, a, my, my theater and arts interest into uh, writing about other things. You've mentioned earlier about my food book and my book on the Hudson Valley and book and gardening. Um, but I try, I, I, you know, I, they're not all real separate categories. They, they, um, they intersect, for example, in an essay, well, more than 30 years ago that I wrote about Chekhov, I tried to create a fictional section in it. I created a fictional section in one, in one of the sections of that essay. And I, and I wrote about Chekhov as a gardener. Mm. Uh, I, I'd read his letters and I knew how much he was interested in his uh, right. rose bushes and he well, wrote about them and everything. Yeah, you wrote about Pirandello because the name Maranca, you know, comes. Yeah, yeah. Comes so, up. And Maranca was a porter in um, one of Pirandello's plays, which is, I said, why the Marancas came to America. <laughs> yeah. Incredible. If I know right, you worked over a year, you know, just on one essay, you know, for... for, for... I could do that at one time. I spent uh, about a year with that. Um, and you know, you know how I put it together. I, I wrote it in separate sections and there are maybe 10 or 15 or 20 sections. And um, I spread them out on the floor and, uh, mm -hmm. and I kind of figured out what, how they would go together. And that's how I wrote the sequence. But I was actually very proud because um, Susan Sontag had complimented me on that essay. And after thinking about it for many years, I thought maybe it was probably, it, it might have been because I said that Pirandello had an argument against photography in his work. Mm -hmm. So I always thought to myself, maybe that's why she liked it. Uh, I don't she know, but it, yeah. since I admired her so much, you know, that was a big thrill for me to yeah. have that from her in the 80s, the mid 80s. Yeah. 
maybe connected to her you also an essay you know about the suffering of others which you know really also really critically looks at photography and the representation mm -hmm. uh, of an image um you know by the way speaking of that i had a long conversation with her of some months before she died, but maybe eight months or so before she died. And at the time she said she was reading the biography of Goya and <laughs> Goya, the cover of that book regarding the pain of others is a Goya. Yeah, book. and she and, talks uh, about it also in an yeah, essay. She, most significant uh, essay also that Trevor Floyd, of course, clean, but also the time we live in, you know, how do, how do we we present? Um, I mean, it's, it's an incredible uh, project, PAJ uh, Magazine. Um, if I may say that, if I understood right, uh, instead of uh, writing, you know, the dissertation, you and Gautam Dasgupta, who were the great founders of this, you know, instead of writing on Bob Wilson or um, on, uh, I don't know what you, you were writing about, you said, let's do our journal. This is going to be our dissertation. Of course, you ran into trouble and it wasn't accepted. Uh, uh, and, um, and you said, I'd never want to be in places where I'm you know, in working places also where I fenced in, I need my, my freedom. So you created something you also called an alternative to performance studies, a field of, you know, where you can, a garden where there are offerings out. You say you write out of love, actually, like the, the joy, the enjoyment is, is, is important um, of you. It's, uh, as you said, a place for thinking out loud, what we do in a way at the Siegel Talks. So I think your deep belief in the gravity of word, words and to make the process of thinking visible, visible and, you, and it's archived, it's there. In 200 years from now, 300, a lot of stuff will be gone. Nobody will know, but people will be able to read PAJ, TDR and, and writings you know, about this time. Um, yeah, and you know, focus. people don't realize that because the focus is so much on production. For those of us who write criticism or even published plays and things, the found, foundations never supported things like that. They were always interested in supporting a production, not a publication of a play. And many people have the false sense that uh, the production is the most important thing. Of course, it's important to get the work known, but the plays will disappear if they're not published. For example, we published Irene Fornes in 1977, right at the time she did Fefu, but except for Adrian Kennedy, all of her peers are forgotten. Remember, Irene had a theater, uh, uh, the theater strategy uh, producing agency for playwrights that Julie Babasso, Rochelle Owens, uh, Ronnie Savelle, Adrian and, uh, and Irene uh, were involved in. So many plays and uh, playwrights uh, have disappeared. There's so many names I can mention from that period. Yeah. They're, they're all gone. I, Unfortunately, the theater has not been very good about preserving its legacy, unlike the art world or the dance world. Everybody moves on. Like I've been shocked to learn how few people that I'd come across in publishing PAJ um, knew, had ever studied or knew of Reza Abdo or the Squat Theater. And my feeling is they probably don't know um, the open theater. Theater study changed so much and, and academia changed so much that um, um, the curriculum, um, you know, was really totally revamped around mm -hmm. uh, around theory. And so I think a lot of people aren't really given the tools. But the archival aspect, I know because I'm working on our archive now with a consultant, and I I've saved everything for 45 years of all the correspondence and yeah, yeah, yeah. all that. This is really important as a record. Um, so much of what any magazine or review covers uh, really it, it was the foundation of creating theater history or performance history or visual arts. Um, it's really the, the, you know, the books and the publications that are, that are so important um, in keeping work alive so that it can get in the repertoire and so that it can be studied. Because sometimes people are forgotten in their own time and then someone finds them and maybe 20, 30 years later, um, they are looked at again. I think, you know, with the case of Adrian Kennedy now and all the focus yeah. on her, that's um, that's a case where that is happening. Or it did, you know, in recent years when Reza Abdo had the exhibit at PS uh, One in Queens. So um, having saving these materials um, and having having the manuscripts or things in print is is very important. Um, 
the videos now as well. Mm -hmm. So how do you approach writing editing? What is your process? How do you how do you think about the craft of writing and editing? What for everybody who listens and is in the field, what do you think is of importance? When you say the craft, uh, you know, you just have to keep writing and writing and writing. Um, you know, you one just sits down with the blank page, like a painter might sit, sit down with the blank canvas. You hope uh, the ideas come. You you mentioned earlier that an essay, the, the Pirandello essay, that took a year. I also spent a year on Gertrude Stein, who had always been an obsession of mine from graduate mm -hmm. school. Um, I read and read and read and take notes. I think I had about 90 pages of notes um, for Gertrude Stein. And then you just sit down with a blank piece of paper. I have a system for um, generating my notes all on loose leaf paper coded with what the topic is. And um, I try to cover things in my notes and my thoughts, but I never outline anything. Um, I don't do abstracts or all that. I do a lot of rewriting. I used to write longhand, but you know, since the 90s, at least mid 90s, I um, worked on a computer. Um, but I, I used to do everything longhand and then type it. Um, but uh, I think I think writers are always readers. Certainly, that's the case with poets and novelists. I'm not sure uh, to what extent, um, say, people writing about theater are reading novels or reading other essays. I've always loved the essay. Uh, and I've always been an editor um, or connected with journalism from high school. I, I was an editor on my uh, high school paper. And in college, I um, started the drama and arts page of my college paper and began writing. No. I don't know where the impulse came from, but I, I just wanted to write about work. I, I was never tempted to perform or act or do anything or direct or any, anything like that. But um, <clears throat> And then when I came to New York in the early 70s, I also worked for other publications and changes, for example, which was a wonderful downtown arts publication that was edited by the wife of Charlie Mingus, the jazz musician. Wow. And then Soho came along and then PAJ, we, we started PAJ in 76. So for Rolling Stones, right? I did. I wrote for I I was a music critic and I wrote for Crawdaddy and Rolling Stone and um and you worked for Max Eisen, downbeat, downbeat. Broadway agent. So it's quite. A, yeah, I, I did a lot of things. I wrote. I worked for a very famous Broadway agent. I we had an office in the Sardi Building. <laughs> he was a press agent. He was very well known. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so I, I did a, a lot of things. I wrote for. Um, also, I mean, I worked for a producer of, of jingles. And that was when Barry Manilow was writing a lot of jingles and Carly Simon was coming up and all that and they would come through our office. So I found my way to graduate school and at that time, uh, you know, I was also doing a lot of freelance work. Then we started the journal. But what I'm saying is like from high school to now, I've been an editor or <laughs> working um, in journal and journalism. Yeah, so you have been trained. I know Lillian Hellman, the great playwright, was one of your teachers. The great Harold Kluman. Harold Kluman, yeah. Who came from the group theater who has influenced American theater and actually, as uh, many say, you know, um, actually also influenced American film. Film acting in America is come, uh, comes from, of course, the uh, active studio, but mm -hmm. he made a case, uh, or many do make a case, to say actually, you know, the way the group theater performed and many of the actors went to Hollywood, this uh, created the American um, acting. You were trained by Daniel Gerald, uh, by Andre Virg, who we both yeah. know so well. Um, mm -hmm. When it comes to writing and editing, what what do you keep in mind? What are, you, what are the lessons? If we say we perhaps, a lot of um, people are moving away a little bit from it at that time we are in. What, what, what is the beauties, the mysteries, but also what are your secrets? Well, how do you, what, what is of importance well, writing? Well, I, I started to say that um, I've always loved the essay. I, I, I like it because it's reading thinking and that appeals to me very much. Um, just simply the engagement with mind. Um, I love the form. I love the form of, uh, of the essay and I've been reading essays and journalism since undergraduate days. Um, I read a, a lot of different kinds of work uh, extensively, but since you mentioned some of these teachers, um, I wrote an essay about <laughs> Lillian Hellman also in that, in that same book, Theater Writings. Mm -hmm. um, 
And <clears throat> what, uh, what I, I, I studied with her at Hunter College for one or two courses. And uh, I think in creative writing or something, um, but not in, not in theater at all. But I love the words, the way that she said the word writer. And that's what I wrote about in my, my essay. As far as Dan Gerald, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the way I take notes for my writing is based on my, the way I took notes in his class. Dan uh, Gerald was a great, great teacher. And um, we studied in a way that people don't study anymore. For example, you might take a whole, a whole semester on comedy or melodrama or tragic comedy or say avant-garde plays between the wars or you know things like that and dramatic structure that was his big set course uh, two semesters of that so he was he very much taught from the point of view of, of, of structure and that's the way i approach work also just really take apart the mechanics of the work and try to put it back together uh, let the work speak to me and keep reading and reading reading it or looking at it, to, you know, taking notes. I don't take notes when I go to the theater, though. Um, so with Dan's method, you, you know, that's how I arrived at my method that I had described about, you know, loose leaf paper and taking notes and having the subject of that note and then somehow coordinating and putting it together. But it directly comes from the method of his classroom. As far as Andre Veert, he's a great uh, figure in, um, education for um, changing the German system um, <clears throat> after he left the United States and went back to Germany, where he founded the theater um, science uh, uh, division or department at uh, Gießen near Frankfurt. And uh, <clears throat> he was one of the most brilliant imaginative people I know. And I, I know a lot of really smart and brilliant people, but the way that he saw everything in this kind of dialectical way was also a, a kind of training and, 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 and humor that he brought in his great loyalty and friendship. But he was teaching Heine Mueller and ideas about the post-dramatic in the, you know, the early 70s at CUNY. So uh, we then became you know, lifelong friends and I often stayed with him in, in Berlin or he stayed in my apartment here. But, um, it, it, you know, he just saw everything in a, in a very different way and he was very aesthetically inclined. So, I mean, these are just, a, you know, a few of the- Clerman, tell us- came in close contact with. Yeah. Harold Clerman, you- Harold Clerman was so inspiring. I, I you know, I, I remember him, um, jumping up and down in class and turning red. We were all afraid he was going to have a heart attack. He, he was an old man then. He was also at Hunter. I, I think that you, you know, it's not necessarily that you learn, you know, rules or techniques or methods from people. It's not like studying acting when you're in a classroom or you're reading criticism or something. It, it's more a, a person's um, work ethic and spirit and energy that flow through or their 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 rigor and their attachment to their field. I'm, I'm very um, much admiring of work ethics. That's why I love Chekhov. And I think uh, that's attracted me so much to plays of Irene Fornes as well. Uh, the, the work ethic, I, I've come from the middle class and I worked all the time since high school and work is, is a certain kind of, um, <clears throat> certain kind of, uh, commitment and it's a commitment to a certain set of values. And that's what you learn from people. Uh, you're on your own in terms of developing um, techniques and styles and you hope they come, you hope you have ideas from seeing things. I, I, I don't write any more about work that, I don't, that doesn't really appeal to me or I don't like. I, just as I no longer have a year to spend on an essay, I, um, I don't feel like writing any more about artworks that um, just don't um, move me in some way. So you really say, you see you, 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 a couple of times it came up, you say I write out of love for what I see or what I'm interested in. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I mean, I love, I love art. I love the idea of performance. I, I, um, Yeah, I, I don't. I, I I write out of love for for a work, uh, out of somehow not not all the times, and I mean not all the times in my life, and not every single moment. Um, 
but in in choosing work, I uh, there is a certain amount of love or a certain sense of living in that landscape or understanding work. It's very hard to write. It's hard to write about something that you're half interested in or so. Um, I mean, I, I I love I love writing and I love the essay, as I said. Um, um, just the exercise of thinking about art and going deeply into something um, is is uh, you know mysterious and beautiful, and it's it's also very it's a private act in a way. Um, I love, uh, you know, the way some artists, the, the certain sense of striving for grace and um, and people who have a real value system in their work that attracts me more and more. Though, to be honest, I I have I I, I have maybe less interest in writing about art now. Writing about the arts, I I, I don't know. I'm I, I don't know what I'll do after this book of mine comes out in the spring, which has, which is 10 years of my um, essays and interviews and conversations with artists. I, I really like talking with artists. I like the conversation form. I spent a lot of time during this lockdown period of listening to um, conversations with writers, particularly novelists or writers and thinkers. I, 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 I and at different periods in my life, I turned to other things like the garden writing or um, the Hudson Valley book or food writing. Um, I'm not worried about what I <clears throat> wanted to do next. I don't have that sense of compulsive productivity. It's fine if uh, I don't have something in mind to start the day after I finish something else. It's okay, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't know what uh, the, the world is so complex now, and it's so um, difficult to place oneself. There's so much of everything. There's so much of every kind of commentary, and there's such a proliferation of things. It's hard to just um, decide what is to start out to, to say where you started out earlier about what is meaningful now. That's the question. Mm -hmm. what, what, what is meaningful? It's not a question of just doing something for the sake of doing it, but what, what is the real um, value uh, of it? And where does, where does it, you know, where does it take one? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think in, in, in that great issue of uh, uh, being here, PAJ 100 after 100 issues and uh, you know, I know you now since going online um, with MIT um, next to the print issues, and it's a miracle it's still out in print, you know, but you have 120 countries, you have readers from uh, all around the world. And but the question is what you said, wrote is how, how should I act in the world? Yeah, that's the question. I mean, Camus says, I love Camus writing, and um, I, I've often taught and read. Um, his essay, Create Dangerously, which was his Nobel Prize speech. <clears throat> but he says that, um, you know, um, you can't like run away from the world, but you can't also be um, overtaken by it. You know, um, in a way, in a way, you know, the question now uh, that I've asked myself also is, um, <clears throat> You know, in the midst of all this uh, destruction and all the uh, anxiety and um, anger that so many people have felt in these last four years with the government, the shock of seeing how quickly uh, our democracy can collapse, um, and that the people that we counted who run the government that to just let it go if they if they could. So. Um, the, you know, I asked myself over the summer too, when I was out, out in the city and just enjoying uh, nature, um, you know, I, I feel that you have to preserve some sense of happiness and joy for yourself. I'm basically a, 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 a contented person, not a, as opposed to being a depressive, you know, and I, I feel like I have to preserve something like that. You can't get up every day and be overwhelmed by uh, 
all the world's problems. But of course, to be a thinking, acting person, you need to know that and absorb that in your work, whatever whatever work you do, teaching, writing, uh, any field. Uh, to go back to Camus, he says um, also that every person has something to contribute to the world, to change the world, to make it different. And it's not that artists can just do that. Any ordinary person, every day you see the you know, simple acts of, of uh, beauty and, um, <clears throat> and grace and uh, kindness that ordinary people um, uh, enact. So, so it's, it, it, in a way, I was discussing this with, a, uh, with, with Meredith Monk sometime in the fall, we were talking and we, we were both talking about the same thing. It's to, to, to even feel a certain kind of happiness or joy in like what 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 does one have the right to do that or do or, or should we preserve that uh, or how can we do that and and not feel guilty about it in the midst of all that is going on around us but i i think all i think all religions and in her case buddhism um and and uh, in terms of my own philosophy also i think it's important to um to have have a a part of yourself um uh, that you, that, and even Patti Smith talks about this in one of her recent books. I'm a big admirer of her writing. Um, you just need that some part of yourself. Actually, Alan Capro wrote about this decades ago and um, when he wrote about John Cage in an essay called Right Living, he talked about the beautiful, beautiful privacy of the artist. So artists, individuals, everybody, there's some part of yourself that you, um, that you need to preserve and create out of that. Mm -hmm. And that's a certain kind of joy or a, a certain kind of um, happiness that um, Hannah Arendt as well talks about loving the world. Mm -hmm. You know, so some yeah. people can't do that. Some people manage to do it. But that for me is sort of the question, uh, one of the questions now. Our, our attachment to the world um, in the midst of trying to solve so many problems and, and coming out of this. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the, the thing is, is art transforming people? You know, is it, are we transformed by the, act of you know drawing you also write about drawing performance drawings which you like very much are we transformed the singer on the stage or is the the artist who does it or is we the audience you know and um, what's what's the, what do you think is the is the essence then of art yeah i mean the an audience is definitely transformed but so is the artist i mean john cage referred to it as the self alteration of the artist Perhaps you could say that's another form of self-improvement, which is a big American theme. But um, he talked about it as self-alteration for the for the artist. I think we're moved by everything. It doesn't have to be art, extraordinary. But, but there are extraordinary works that are sublime. I mean, uh, before the lockdown, um, I, I guess it was a year and a half ago. I'm not quite sure. Um, I saw Anne Teresa de Kirsmacher's work at the Skirball, and I've seen her work also um, at similar pieces um, at uh, Brooklyn Academy of Music. I mean, it was absolutely sublime and transporting. Um, mm -hmm. There are works like that. I think William Kendrick. Kendrick. Yeah, I know you're a big fan of Kendrick. Yes, I, I am. I followed his work for years. Um, his Head and the Load, <clears throat> which was done at the Armory, about two years ago, it was another ex extraordinary work that required even new uh, inventions of new kinds of projection equipment and lenses, uh, worked with music and text, highly political with projected drawings. I, I'd become over the last decade or dozen years, very interested in performance and drawing. And often my research interests um, come into the journal. So we've been publishing for a dozen years now these portfolios on performance and drawing. Uh, many, many artists have um, a practice of, of drawing uh, and making studies before they um, produce a work. 
some people say like Joan Jonas, she's famous for that, draws in the work itself. Um, and there's a there, there's actually recently a new book out called Performance Drawing. I wrote the foreword to it. It came out from Bloomsbury in London just uh, in September, um, and it has a uh, many many uh, chapters and things on uh, artists and um, drawing. So I love I love work on paper. You could say writing is that in a, in mm -hmm. a sense. But yeah. Bob Wilson's work is is work on paper. Works on paper because he draws his whole um theatrical work before it's staged he basically stages his yep. drawing so he has a visual book mm -hmm. yeah so absolutely. I'm, I'm interested in these things and bringing these kinds of new ideas um into the journal things about notation and mm -hmm. and drawing i'm interested in notebooks and, and, and drawing uh, is process. A, yeah it, it's an action i think Roland Bart also became later in his life he loved uh, japanese uh, you know ink drawings he said it's an action yeah. mm -hmm. With your body in a moment and it also represents something in the sign or word you know often signs in asian languages they are there there is something that is so deeply connected you know to, to yeah even john berger the great critic he also has a book on drawing and he drew um mm -hmm. so many people have this practice i don't i don't draw actually um but uh i i i just Yes. Yeah, but you're right. So you would encourage people to take up writing as a as a form, right? For students, artists. You know, you, you don't do that anymore as much as we should. You know, everybody. Uh, artists, you mean? Yeah. They, they, yeah. I mean, we used to have many many more artists used to write about um, about their work, and that's kind of unfortunate now. I love artists' writings. A lot of visual artists write about their work, or novelists write, um, but. Theater people don't really write so much about um, their work. Um, there are very few books, um, not to mention all the histories and monographs and things we're missing in the theater field because of people's move into, um, uh, in, into um, theory and into other kinds of studies. The, uh, the monograph and the history that used to be written, you know, in the 60s, 70s, whatever. Um, they uh, have fallen by the wayside. So we don't have a, a comprehensive history of the, of the Judson uh, theater, which encompassed the Judson poets as well as Judson dance. We don't have a history of La Mama, of the public theater, of uh, theater, you know, so, so many different theaters uh, and so many different artists should have biographies <laughs> written about them in many critical books. Mm, you know, yeah, yeah. Artists, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and one day people might, you know, find old hard drives and will try to recover deleted versions of things was used to be written on paper. I think always, you know, you, you talk about history and the significance of it, you know, on the even the PAJ, the places where your offices were, the places where theater was, the idea of history and um, uh, represented also in theater. Um, um, I think you have a deep sense of almost of as, as a mission or as a, uh, obligation and uh, so what is your relation to to that concept of history what does it represent to you you know it's funny i one of the colleges i applied to in high school was uh, was to go as a history major but i ended up becoming a, a having another major um, but i i guess i'm interested in history because i'm a traveler and i love i uh, love uh, knowing about histories and cultures and uh and i it was intri always intrigued me when i was teaching that often people confuse history and nostalgia it's a very big difference between having a historical perspective on a on a field or a topic or a theme than just having a more sentimental or kitschy or nostalgic uh, feeling though one could have nostalgia too that's fine but um people are very uh, wary about history and don't care about it so much anymore. And I think it's uh, considering the complexity of the world and um, uh, suddenly look at the resurgence of discussion about authoritarianism and uh, um, 
and fascism and all that, if you don't know that, or you don't know 20th century history, it'd be hard to create work out of that or to, or to, or to grapple with ideas today. Some of the books I've been reading lately, uh, Tw Twilight of Democracy, The Seductive Lore of Authoritarianism, Alan, uh, Ann Applebaum's book, or um, uh, Masha Gessen, Surviving Autocracy. I mean, these are the kind of books that are, you know, that are important to read now. Um, so with regard to the arts on a, on a different level, uh, we talked earlier about the idea of having, a, having documents or archives. That's a big issue now um, in terms of the materials that are saved from all this 50 year period. Um, many artists are, are placing or in the process of, uh, or have already put uh, their archives in different institutions. Um, and that's our lasting record. Uh, PAJ, when it started out, so much of that theater downtown uh, was um, just uh, becoming known. Uh, so we made a lot of that work known in our journal or as TDR did. Um, and now we're in the process of, of people writing about performance history, which is the history of this. So now we have 45, 50, 60 years of this history. And that's a big field of scholarship. Um, a lot of people are dealing with some of the major figures in the post-war period and, um, you know, uh, resuscitating them or um, <clears throat> uh, having more scholarly works on him, for example, on the Judson dance period or Yvonne Rayner or Charlotte Mormon or Nam June Paik or um, uh, Carol Schneeman, you know, uh, a lot of it is happening within the visual arts and performance um, worlds, um, where where people are suddenly, um, uh, you know, are, are producing more historical works and more uh, more uh, essays, and especially in that field, Charlotte Mormon is a case in point too. Um, so uh, I think people are. In scholarship, certain certain people in scholarship, historians are very interested in, um, in in retelling the histories of these fields. So I I'm I'm concerned with the curriculum and with um, what students learn now and and uh, and restoring more of a sense of the history of the great art forms as well as social and political history because I don't see how we can have a serious theater without people um, and training change, changing. Mm. Yeah, we, we need to know where we, we come from, uh, to know where we are going to. And, uh, and we have said it before, you know, you know, someone said it's important to know about history because then you learn that people don't learn from history, you know, <laughs> otherwise you wouldn't know that. So, you know, it's a real, a, a great contribution in a way. And also that um, kind of split you do make as the art, as you said, as a, such an intimate personal practice as a human being is such an individual experience, but also that it's kind of connected, you know, to global history and national history that there are is a way to, you know, to, to put arms um, arms around it, and those arms are a little bit uh, a little bit bigger. I, I remember you commented on on Bob Wilson who said Jack Danny was so great on TV because his <laughs> arms weren't so big, so we, they would fit in the TV screen. So we should have longer arms, and these long arms of history. You know, I think you really in your work um, with P A J. You know, you 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 it's a great long poem of. Uh, of a hundred and more issues that is, you know, collecting <laughs> Thank the, you. the poly, polyphonic voices that talk to each other and uh, oh, they're all alone, little islands like a, Edouard Glissant's idea of the archipelagos, which I love so much. So they are little islands, but altogether they are, you know, an archipelagos. And I think this is what you, what you created. Um, I also know, and I wanted to ask you that, you know, the symbolic act uh, of an actor on the stage, and I, would like to go to something specific because I know you love uh, singers. Uh, I know you're a big fan of uh, Judy Garland and other, you know, you the what, and tell us a bit about that, you know, you go to and see them. What, why is that significant? What does it mean that a person on a stage who sings, you know, what does it mean to you? <laughs> tell us a bit about your, your yeah. I know you're a music lover. 
you know, yeah, uh, I know I do love singers, um, but it's, it reminds me of something that um, Philip Glass said when um, he was asked what Einstein on the beach means. And he said, it's not important what, it's, what it means. I don't know what it means, but the important thing is that it's meaningful. So I don't know what singing, I don't know what singing means. The thing about it is it's mysterious. You don't see it. And this incredible voice comes out of people. You think of Maria Callas or um, how does that, where does that voice uh, come from that? Uh, it's so, it, it's so incredible uh, um, an act. Uh, it, it, it's invisible and it just comes out of a person's mouth and breath. Um, I've always loved singers. Um, you know, I, I grew up at a time when uh, a lot of singers had had their own television shows, all the American singers. And so I was very familiar with the American songbook. And um, even now, and I, and I love, uh, you know, Ella Fitzgerald or the, the young Barbara Streisand or Edith Piaf. And uh, I mean, there's so many singers. I, I'm a, I, I'm, I'm, I've always been a great music lover. Um, so I listen to a lot of music. I, I have music, a, a lot of it from other cultures. Uh, where I, when I'm traveling, I'm I'm buying things, uh, buying you know at that time CDs. I don't I don't listen with um, ear pods, and I don't have like a playlist or anything. I like music in the open air, but I'm very interested also in singers' gestures, um, and. It's interesting to watch the singers who grew up or who became known before microphones, how much they use their arm and their elbows, or comparing the way singers like the way Peggy Lee moves as opposed to someone like, you know, Judy Garland or, uh, or you, you, you can mention any, any, uh, any singers. Um, I, I also follow very much when I can younger singers. I thought that Amy Winehouse was incredible, uh, like uh, you know uh, Billy uh, Billy Holiday. I, I love her work, and Amy Amy Winehouse was singing in that style. Um, Tony Bennett is a is a great singer, and I, I you know the show that she did with Lady Gaga was was um, you know so intriguing. I I just um, I I um, I don't know. I, I don't know what to say. I I just have always loved uh, music and singers. We did in my, in my family where I grew up. My father always sang around the house, and we all played musical instruments. I played piano. I have a piano in my apartment, though I don't play so much anymore. Um, I don't write about singers all that much, but I uh, but I mean I've written a lot about Mer Meredith Monk. Um, uh, not, but more about her theater than uh, her particular voice, but her voice is her theater. Um, and I have written about Barbara Streisand and and, uh, and and Judy Garland and and other singers and musicians. Um, of I course, you could see that. them all live in the beginnings of careers or end of careers. You know, we we, we can't go back. Yeah, I know. I wrote about early jazz um, in, at the same time I was going to graduate school about. Um, blues or jazz and blues and things like that. So, I mean, I, 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 I go to the opera. I, I, I mean, I, I like, I, I, I love that um, transcendent feeling of the, of the great voices. Um, I, I used to go to musical theater in, when, when there were more of the, old, you know, like Sondheim musicals and things like that, when some of the great musicals were on, were on Broadway, though I don't really go, any, go, go anymore. But I saw a lot of the old, I mean, I've seen a lot of the great performers, um, musical comedy performers and great Broadway stars like Ethel Merman or Gwen Verdon, uh, you know, it was possible to see these people or Streisand on Broadway, some of the old stars. I, you know, in a way, I have to say that I, I, I really feel like a, 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 a very eclectic performance person because I can enjoy any of that work or any of the standard um, traditional songbook um, just as much as I can enjoy something downtown or something something experimental I don't I never really d distinguished um, between things I love I love virtuosity and great 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 talent and um, e everything is, is is interesting if you, if you watch an old movie the way people speak or their gestures it feeds into an idea of acting and and um, and performance 
I know so, you wrote in your, a piece about the time, the Corona time about duck soup, right? The Marx Brothers that somehow <laughs> relates to, to, to where we are, right? Well, it, it, you, you know, uh, yeah, I, I wrote in an editorial in PAJ that um, sometimes the Trump world reminds me of an old Dick Cavage play, you know, or, um, or duck soup is one of these things that take place in a fictional country where all these ministers are mm -hmm. are trying to satisfy this you know crazed ruler um yeah, yeah. yeah. hopefully yeah. we'll be out of that soon, out of that soon. but it's, it is a remarkable you know to see you you know a trained uh, so the, the great, but also your interest in novel and painting and sculpture and film and music and both performance, the high bro, the low bro, what David Saffron also, you know, wrote about. So I think it's quite something to learn. I, I'll be coming closer to the end of our talk. And of course, it should be much longer or different versions of it. I think we just scratched the surface. But um, if you would see the young uh, Bonnie Maranka, um, who is just getting into a Hunter College now, <laughs> has her, has her um, I don't know, most probably didn't have a backpack at the time you had it. <laughs> no. Yeah, you had a little uh, a suitcase. Okay, a little book bag, probably. Book bag, you know. <laughs> and um, it would be times of corona and this incredible change, you know, that uh, has taken place, which we are in the middle of, you know. I mean, it's just the fact American Theater Magazine from TCG is closed. The, I mean, it's not we fully realize what it means, you know, and so much has moved from the digital. It's the greatest of great changes right now in the moment. What would you say to that young Bonnie Moranka? What is what, what you wish wish you would have known then, but you know now, but you didn't know then at the time, but also in the time we live in now, what do you feel um, is of importance and significance? Well, that's, that, that's a number of different um, questions. Yeah. Um, I think when you're young, you just kind of follow one foot in front of the other. I mean, I, I personally had no grand plan or anything. I don't live my life that way. I, I believe in that you, if you have, uh, you know, beliefs in something, you should follow what you want to do and try to do it against all odds. Of course, people said, oh, you're crazy to start a journal and uh, we didn't listen to anybody. Um, you, you just have to find a way to do what you want to do and to be happy in your life. And then you, because you have to wake up every day for 50, 60 years and work. So you have to love what you're doing. Um, as far as any kind of topics now, if I were a young student going, uh, one topic that interests me, even though I say that I want to preserve a certain kind of joy and feel that we have a, have a, have a right to also keep that for ourselves, some part of our life. I'm very interested in the um, the 20th century kinds of artworks that deal with the catastrophic imagination. Um, so th that's a, another side and, um, and something different. But just in in uh, in summing up an answer to you, I would say what what I've always loved is the and this is kind of my motto, and I discovered it somewhere along in the early 70s or mid 70s. Um, uh, Hannah Arendt said that um, artworks clearly are superior to all living things. They stay longer in the world than anything else. And they are the, since they stay longer in the world than anything else, they are the worldliest of things. And I've always, that, that I always keep that um, close to me. And um, and I, I mean, I believe in 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 art and in its power to transform people, um, people's inner lives, and to and as a driving spirit and force in the world. Not enough to change the world, but to be a part of that change because it changes um, people. And so I, I have, you know, uh, I have favorites that spoke so deeply about art and politics and culture and and, and philosophy. People like Václav Havel mm -hmm. uh, or Camus, as I said, uh, Hannah Arendt has been so important um, to my thinking. So I think we all have our touch stars and we, we uh, and um, they, you know, they keep us going. Um, and, and we just, we just, you know, we just keep going day after day after day and try to pursue um, 
uh, what's important, what's important to us. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember you quote Václav Havel, you know, who had to hide, as you wrote, some of his manuscripts in trees. He writes so yeah. it's about trees, you know, about Wilson's work with trees and yeah. glands through the forest and Orlando and tablet machine. And the water mildred is the beautiful ones. But uh, it stuck with me, that idea that you, you quoted Havel, also a philosopher, statesman, you know, who combined mm -hmm. so much, you know, of that, um, what is important. I don't fully remember the quote, but he, he, had, he maybe I'll find it somewhere. The quote was something about, um, you know, the world has its reality and, um, but we can't, and, and so, do, so does political life and the political order, but that is not all, all, all of our world. We have our own subjective um, world also, and we can't depend on these other systems to keep us going or to change the world. In other words, we have to change ourselves. He talked about um, uh, a lot of these things in this very influential essay, The Power of the Powerless or Living in Truth, his famous book. Yeah. And, and also Georg Simmel, the uh, sociologist, early, much earlier in the, in the 20th century, talked about like objective reality and subjective reality. Um, we are always living on two layers. There's the world outside and there's also um, what kind of forces and life energy that we have to bring to the world. And we can't always be blaming the system or the outside world. We, we have to, I think we've come to that point now mm -hmm. seeing that um, we are more responsible than, than ever in, in, in creating this world. We cannot just leave it up to you know, government and different systems. There, there's another reality uh, beyond that that we inhabit, and that kind of moral force has to come from within us. Within us, artists have to help. But I think I found the quote, and I would like mm -hmm. to end with it. And um, and he imagined, as he wrote, a moral reconstitution of society, which means a radical renewal of the relationship of human beings to what I call the human order, which no political order can replace. A new experience of being, a renewed rootedness in the universe, a newly grasped sense of higher responsibility, a newfound inner relationship to other people and the human community. These factors clearly indicate the direction uh, in, in which we must go and um, this is a really quite a statement. It's significant. And I think your work uh, in PAJ, your teaching, what are your work, your time you spend in your gardens and upstate, you know, this is, a, you know, I think you do follow uh, these kind of new steps or hobble um, out about it. You made a great contribution and you continue to make it in the future. So in the name of the community, the theater community, of course, I would like to thank you for what you have done. I, as a student, read PAJ, just looking at the images, you know, I always read all the, essays as I should, as you said, people don't read the journals anymore. I'm one of those who just read what was, and then the images, but you know, they were guiding lights in that star. If you really think of uh, the, 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 the heaven and the, the stars and there's some, the, with your little boats where people oriented themselves. It was one of those um, great um, shining stars in the sense of shining. It was so important and it is important and to be in there meant something, it means something. So it's also for us, to have been represented there. Really, thank you for your work. And uh, editing thank you. Thank is you. an art form. And you are, you know, so you're an artist in what you do. And so uh, mm. it's a, a way of uh, practicing art and writing. So, yeah. Thank what you, Fred, for your generous conversation and your comments. I, I really enjoyed talking with you today. Yeah, no, really, we got a sense of Bonnie Maranka. So she's out there, email her, call her, harass her with articles. <laughs> Get inspired by her writing. Do your own writing. Say why everything <laughs> is so terribly and wrong what she does and write manifestos against PAJ. This is what we miss. You know, find your voice that yeah. we talked about. And writing actually can help us, as does drawing or singing. As, as she said, join us again tomorrow. We have the Ailimite company, a young company coming out of the Living Theater, a company that is out there on the streets, a very diverse company. I wish we had the great Judith Malina with us. We were such mm. good friends. She came so often to the Siegel Center. Mm. She, the only thing she came to in New York when she was in the old age home out in New Jersey, she took a 
you know, car and drove there, uh, Brad mm -hmm. would bring her and we would talk. So we really miss her. It would have been so important to hear what she had to say. Um, but um, let's see what that young company does, which is out there on the streets in Brooklyn, protesting against pipelines that are supposed to go through neighborhoods and other things. They just did the Camus reading with us at the white box. Um, uh, a revolt in Asturias where Camus warned against the ghosts of fascism, you know, that are only detected. It started at an election night. And then the great Eurekan Poetry Cafe we will have on Friday, uh, Daniel and artists um, who uh, spoken word artists and we will hear from the community. How is that going for them this, this time? of Corona. But again, Bonnie, thank you. Thank you. I hope I thank didn't you. take you uh, too long. The great HowlRound, thank you for having us, for hosting us, Thea and VJ. It means the world to us. And this was, a, well, I think, a, an inspiring conversation. And yeah, this will inspire me to write. Maybe I'm always also a bit shy to do it and say, what does it mean about listening to you? You know, we, we have to find our voices and it's important what we do and to do some talks here and there. So thank you, Bonnie. Good. Thank you. What's thank for you. lunch today or for dinner? Are you a cook? What's what's <laughs> Oh well I I'm trying to stay away from pasta. I had some yesterday, yeah. but I, I just made some sauce. But you know, I like I like uh, watching the cooking shows too. I, even if I don't have to eat it all, you know, yeah, it's something with yeah. performance. You don't have to see everything, but reading about it sometimes is good. Sometimes helps, you know. And what's <laughs> the difference a day later? Did you eat it and you saw that? Or no, I ate it all. Show? What is the memory <laughs> in the mind? I know you wrote a whole book about pasta, so, uh, <laughs> so I know you are a, a big fan of it. So all the best, and I hope all we will get together soon and good yeah. stuff, have great holidays. And thank you all for listening. And what Bonnie talks about, it is not, you know, that we know just know about her and we, we, we congratulate and celebrate her work, but it is really in the sense what she did about transforming the people, audiences. So that's meaningful to you. So there's something in there that is of significance. So you pick up a pen, write things down for 20 minutes a day, or write a friend, a mail or a letter, a good old letter, a great poets projects out there. People say we Go back to letter writing. People write themselves letter now by the mail, by to not yeah. only to support to support the post office, but also as an artistic artistic practice. So bye bye. I should stop <laughs> now. We always say I, it's about radical listening, and then I could go on talking. But it was a great <laughs> conversation. Thank you, Bonnie. And yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, we wait for the snow. <laughs> <laughs>